Greetings to all of you in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you, Dr. Pushparaj, for the warm welcome and the good words you have shared. And I pray that our time together will be a time of blessing and uh, a time when the Lord will speak to us. I want to thank uh, the church for giving me the opportunity to share the, the word of God during the retreat. And I pray that the Lord will help me to speak to your heart. You know, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders build in vain, so we need always God's help. So we let us trust God. Thanks, uh, uh, thank you again, church, and may the Lord continue to bless. Um, I have only heard about the church. I understand my daughter-in-law when she was in DIT used to come to our party fellowship and uh, so I think maybe connected with you and I thank God uh, for uh, the blessings uh, you have been showering upon the community uh, through the testimony of the church. There are three sessions allocated for me and I would like to give you the challenges the word of God placed on a spiritual man or a Christian in today's world. In the first session we will be concentrating on a shining, a being a shining Christian in a very dark world. I like to use another word, being a luminous Christian in a very dark world. And also the second session we will be looking into being fruitful in very difficult times. And thirdly, how to have intimate relationship with God. We'll be looking into the life of Moses there. Let's look into the word. You have just heard uh, the passage read to uh, each one of us. It is from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, beginning from verse 12 to verse 16. Let me pray. Before I share the word, Lord Jesus, bless our heart, help us to understand your word. Thank you, Lord, for the church. Thank you, Lord, for the many believers that are being blessed and nurtured in the church. And Lord, we pray that today as we sit at your feet, you will speak to our hearts. Help me to speak your word. Give me anointed lips. A clean heart, help me to lift your name up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So you all know this is a letter written by Apostle Paul and always known to many of us as a, an epistle of joy. Some have counted the number of uh, times the word joy or rejoice is mentioned. It is almost 16 times. But all, although this is an epistle of joy, Paul writing in from the prison, also uh, sharing the joy from the prison, I would say dungeon, and uh, sharing with us the, the joy of the Lord. At the same time, he is placing before us the challenge to shine out for Christ. So he's using the the exact word in verse um, 15, shine in this perverse and crooked generation. Why should we be shining? I think the, the reason is very clear. Paul expressed the generation or described the generation as crooked and perverse generation. Another way of putting it is a very dark world. Bible pictures evil and wickedness as darkness. And I think it is a very good picture to show what uh, wickedness is. The present world, we should describe it as not darkness, it's almost like midnight. And let us see what Paul means by shining in this dark world. How did the world become dark like that? 
it is a generation that is twisted in its thinking and distorted in distorted in lifestyle crooked and perverse generation i don't know how paul would have described the present generation if he was alive at this day at that time when he was living he described the generation as crooked and perverse it happened that way because the world rejected god romans 121 is a very good picture they knew god but they did not glorify him so they became foolish in their heart or says you can read that in chapter 1 of romans verse 21 claiming to be wise they became fools that is verse 22 see when truth is rejected light is rejected when light is rejected everything becomes dark god revealed the, to all of us for our generations his light through his revelations in the past through the scriptures and also through his son but when the light is shown and when it is rejected darkness comes in john's gospel chapter 3 verse 19 this is what we read light has come into the world men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil they love darkness so they rejected light see when you reject light mind becomes dark when our mind is darkened heart becomes crooked when heart is not right life body becomes defiled and when our life becomes defiled the society becomes crooked and perverse this is all because when they had the revelation of god truth of god they rejected i think it's the same thing today when you look around people reject the truth god is revealed and when truth is rejected light is rejected let us see how god handled the darkness from a you know ages uh, ago you know it's not our um, theme to describe the darkness around us sometimes when older people get together they would love to talk about the darkness and the wickedness that goes around it is true but as a church the agenda the task before us is not to describe the darkness the wickedness the evil around us but the task or the challenge before us is to shine out you know in the beginning genesis 1 1 you can see there was darkness god created heaven and earth and the earth was desolate and void and darkness was upon the surface of the deep so ages ago before the creation the world was dark how did god handle it you can see god said in verse 3 of uh, chapter 1 of book of genesis god said let there be light so the darkness at the time of creation was re- removed or uh, was thrown out by the word of god the word of god brought light you know the word is still the lamp unto our feet light unto our path scripture still enlightens us and that's how god handled in the beginning when the earth was void and in darkness he commanded light to shine the word of god but in the created world as you see in chapter 3 of book of genesis sin came in sin came when sin comes in darkness comes in how did god restore light back into that darkness initially he said let there be light and there was light and then sin came into this world and it became dark again so the lord sent his own son this is what we read in chapter 1 of gospel of john verse 
That was the light which gives light to every man coming into the world. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. See the word again. The word became flesh. So when sin came into this world, the Lord sent his own son as the light of the world. In the incarnation of Christ did enlighten many. You can see the book of the, or the gospels, read many, many stories how Jesus touched many lives. Remember the story of Zacchaeus, a man full of greed, in a way living in sin, living in darkness, but Christ touched his life. When the light came into his life, his mind became enlightened, his heart was moved, his life was changed. You can you know when you read that story in Luke's Gospel uh, 19, it's a wonderful change, wonderful conversion. We can say he moved from darkness into light. The light that gives, the, the true light that gives light to every man coming into this world. Jesus not only moved into lives of people, he also moved into the temple to cleanse it. But in the present world, before creation, he commanded light to come and there was light. And when sin entered, he sent his own son as the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world and he enlightened many. But in today's world, the present world, the present generation, we just read it is a crooked generation, perverse generation. Christ is not there in the flesh anymore. So how can this world be light, lightened up again? That is what Paul says. You may be blameless and sincere, sons of God without fault, in the midst of crooked and perverse generation among you, among whom you shine as lights. Sons of God, shining in this world to give light. So before creation, the Lord said, during creation, the Lord said, let there be light. When sin came into the world, the Lord intervened again by sending his son as the light of the world. But today's world, in the present world, through the generation, what's God's remedy? His children. God's command through Paul is to shine in this dark world. Jesus also said, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. And we are to shine in this dark world, being a luminous Christian. Many a times we, we want to say, Lord, intervene into the society. You know, when we pray, Lord, intervene into the society which is so dark, I think God is telling us, you as my children shine in this dark world. I am reminded about the, the song which usually the children sing. I don't think it is children's song. But it is a wonderful song that will fit to the message we are hearing today. Jesus bids us shine with a clear pure light. Jesus bids us shine with clear pure light, like a little candle burning in the night, in this world of darkness, we must shine. Did you hear that word must? In this world of darkness, we must shine, you in your corner and I in mine. So that's a remedy, that's a challenge before us. That's what I want to place before your heart. God always intervened in the times of darkness, as we just uh, heard. But today, God wants to intervene in this dark world. Very wicked generation, how? By his children shining up as the light of the world.
and this is that you are the light of the world. You know, light always brings beauty. It always gives you the direction. It gives you warmth. And that is exactly what the Lord wants. So the mission is very clear to us, isn't it? Not to run away from the dark world, complaining about the darkness and the wickedness around us. I think that's what Christians do. We continue to complain about the darkness, the wickedness, the evil around us. But God doesn't want us to run away from it, but we must shine in this dark world as sons of God without God. Let me give you a few statements. We must be a shining Christian in this dark world. A shining Christian businessman in a very greedy world. A shining faithful Christian in an unfaithful world. A shining unselfish Christian in a very selfish world. A shining clean Christian in an unclean world. A shining loving Christian in a world full of hatred. That's the challenge. You know, that will transform the society. Let me give you a story. Lord Peter Barrow, he lodged with the Archbishop of Canterbury for a few days. Peter Barrow was not a Christian. It's not a, I was not a Christian. But he, for some reason he had to stay with the Archbishop of Canterbury many, many, many years ago, those days. After a few days, he did, decided to leave. Although he was enchanted by the virtue and the piety of the bishop. This is, this is, these are the exact words of his life. He had, to, he had to leave, although Bishop was a very pious, very godly man. Somebody asked him, why are you leaving? This is what he replied, if I stay longer, I will become a Christian in spite of myself. In other words, I don't want to become a Christian. But if I stay here for some more time, I will become a Christian. See the power of a very godly life? Josh McDowell, if you have um, read his book, An Apologetic Preacher. You know, this is what I read about him in his conversion. Although he was a brilliant young man, his uh, past did not give him joy in his heart. He had a very uh, abusive home, I understand. He had so much of um, hatred against his father. But uh, the college in which he was uh, teaching, he became a professor at a very young age, where he was teaching. He met a group of young people who were very, very happy. In the cafeteria, one time he was sitting there, suddenly these children came in. When they came in, they, they were so happy and they sat just close to him. So he turned around and uh, asked the little uh, young girl, Why are you all so happy all the time? You know that young girl had an answer, very short answer. You know, sir, it's all because of Jesus. That made him think. A shining Christian in a very suspicious world, doubting world. What does the Lord want us, want us to do? Wants us to shine. So we learned why and how. Now what is needed? 
to shine. Look into that verse 15, that you may be blameless and sincere. How do we shine? Shine through your life. What kind of a life? Blameless. You know, that word indicates a life lived in such a way that people cannot point their finger at them. Now, I would like to explain it, blamelessness, it points to a life of moral integrity seen by others, visible to others. How should we shine? Blameless life. Living a life of moral integrity seen by others very much visible. Paul writing the Ephesians, he said, sexual immorality and all uncleanness or greed. Let there be not even a mention. I hope you heard my emphasis. Let there be not even a mention. How to live a blameless life? Visible moral integrity. You now when you look into the Bible, in the Old Testament you see a man, young man called Daniel, living in the Babylonian society, crooked society, sinful society, wicked society. But you read in chapter 6 verse 4, they could find no fault in him. You know, picking up um, that character, how did he do that? If you look at his life, you would see the secret. Two secrets. One is his commitment. Commitment to the Lord. Second is his discipline. First chapter of book of Daniel, you cannot miss both of these things. A young man deeply committed to the Lord. Disciplined life so much visible to everyone. How do we have moral purity? Visible moral purity, integrity? Living a blameless life. Commitment and Paul, quoting his own life, he said, I, like, I would like to keep a good conscience toward God and toward man. How to live a blameless life? Try to live a life that is blameless Pure conscience, good conscience, toward God and man. Secondly, Paul says, what we should have. One is, we should have a blameless life. Second is, sincere life. You can see that word again. Blameless and sincere. Verse 15. What is sincerity? I think it is, Inner, inner uh, purity, inward purity. In other words, to explain his unmixed life, there is no mixture. That is what sincere means, isn't it? They say that that word sincere comes from two Latin words, sinisera means without wax. No mixture. Paul said, your life should not be, in, when you look in the inside, not mixed, truly sincere, nothing to hide. Now Spurgeon was a great preacher and a great pastor. As always there were critics there those times too. One time a critic came to him and said, I am going to write about you in the newspaper. You know what he said? Go ahead, son, write it on the sky 
I have nothing to hide. That speaks volumes. Go ahead, son. Write it on the sky. I have nothing to hide. How can we shine? Building a bigger church, having a bigger worship center, better music, better preaching. No. Shine with a blameless life. Shine with a sincere life. Third, do everything without complaining. Look in the verse 14. Be contented. Have the spirit of contentment. You know, we live in a time when people are so discontent. If you are, if you are contented, that would reason and will make you discontent. They will try to attract you. But as a Christian, as people look at us, they must display the spirit of contentment. Paul writing to Timothy also emphasized that part, fact. When we are satisfied, when we are contented, you know, it, it displays a lot of grace to the outside world. But unfortunately, we as believers also fall into the world's trap. We also com we continue to complain about circumstances. We complain about what we have, the positions, and we even complain about God's attitude to us. That's what we do, isn't it? But Paul says, if you want to shine out, have the spirit of content. In the prison, in the same ep same uh, episode, Philippians chapter four, verse eighteen. This great man. Writing to his church says, I have all what I need. Where is he writing from? Writing from prison. Chapter 4 verse 18 he says, I have all what I need. Where did that satisfaction come from? It came from God. You know, when God satisfies your heart, there will be spirit of contentment and satisfaction. So, do without complaining. I am reminded about the Tolstoy story. I hope you know this. There was a king who was always dissatisfied, discontent. You know, when you are discontented, you don't, you don't look happy. So, one day his uh, Minister, advisor told him, King, you need to be happy and contented. So the king asked, what should I do to be contented? And the minister said, you send people around, your soldiers around, find a man who is very much satisfied and contented. If you find a man who is contented, are satisfied. Remove his shirt and bring it and you wear it. The moment you wear it, you will be satisfied. So the soldiers went around. All of them came back empty-handed. So the king was happy. I am dissatisfied. I am discontented. Who so are my citizens? You know, that's what we do, isn't it? Back at, uh, you know, the, the in interior areas, when electricity fails, what people look is, look through the window and see if the neighborhood uh, is having electricity. If all, they also don't have electricity, we are happy. So the king said, I am discontented, so are my citizens. But one soldier said, King, I found a man so happy and satisfied. Then the king asked, where is the shirt? 
And the soldier said he didn't have a shirt. So secret of contentment is not what you have, what you wear, what you travel in, what you live in, the house you live in, the profession you hold. Nothing will satisfy you. You know, as preachers we always preach, Jesus saves and Jesus satisfies. That's a common statement we make. It's not a rhyming word, it is a truth. Jesus saves and Jesus satisfies. So if you are to shine, you need to be blameless, moral integrity. You need to be sincere, unmixed life. You need to be contented. Also it says, you must live a life that is not contentious. You know, we live in a world with different types of people. It's easy to pick up a quarrel or a conflict. There are people, even believers, who are, you know, quick to react and create conflict, make quarrels. Paul writing to Philippian church said, do everything without complaining and disputing. So a luminous Christian has grace to remain calm, at the same time has the grace to speak the truth in love, without making a conflict. You know, Paul writing to Timothy said, As the servant of the Lord must not quarrel. I like the word must. So if you are a sort of an abrasive person always trying to pick on anything that doesn't fit with you and pick up a conflict, we won't be a shining person. We need to do things without disputing. Let me illustrate it from my childhood experience. You know, when we were going to school those days, monsoon came in time, June first. Time to change. New dress, new umbrella, new books, wonderful time. But heavy rain. That's also one. So when we return, lot of puddles on the road. Oh, we enjoy it. You now there's a game we play. We stamp on the puddle with the left leg and when the water splashes up, we kick with the right leg. From school to home we do it. Tough time for my mother washing all the clothes. Books, you know, dresses. As childhood, you know, that's how some Christians are. Any little puddle, they like to kick it up. But I have noticed one thing in my life when I matured, when I see a puddle, I avoid it. To be a shining Christian, blameless, sincere, happy and contented, not quarrelsome. And we you heard all these four points, some of you are saying in That's very true. Impossible. Impossible with man, but possible with God. How can we do it? You know, Paul is a wonderful uh, expressive man. He not only gives you a good place to go, but he always builds the bridge which go over. 
Look into that verse. Being blameless, sincere, contented, avoiding contentions are not easy. But there is something you need to do. What does the Bible say? Same passage, look into verse 30. Work out your salvation. Some of you are saying already, we are taught, we are saved by grace. Working out, you are preaching something outside the gospel. Let me quote the words of D.L. Modi. I think it's Modi. He said, salvation is free. You are saved by grace. That's where we say hallelujah. But subscription, discipleship, payment is very heavy. You can enter free, but you pay a heavy price when you come in. The first word you hear is take up the cross. So being blameless, sincere, happy and contented, not conti non-contentious, not quarrelsome, very difficult to practice, but we need to work it out. Work out your salvation. You know, the problem with many of us is when we come to Christian life, we almost think it is a um, roller coaster ride. Now you just enter in happy ride. It's happy ride, but Paul always says, fight, run the race. It's tough. So we need to work out your salvation. Why? Look into verse 13. Because God has already worked it in. For it is God who is working in, in you, both to will and do of his good flesh. I'd be happy that Paul is writing it, you know, explaining it to us. We need to shine. Yes, it is difficult. Paul says, work it out. How can you work it out? Paul says, God has already worked it in. We need to only work it out what God has on already worked it in. Look at the word. You know that sentence? I was really amazed when I looked deeply at it. Where did God work in? He, he worked in you. I'm so happy. You know, if it was something that was fixed on to me externally, I will lose it quickly. God placed that right inside me. Because inside controls are outside, isn't it? Do you have any doubt? Don't have to doubt it. Inside always controls outside. To, blame, to live a blameless life, to live a sincere life, to live a happy life, to live a uh, non-quarrelsome life, we need something inside or in our heart. God has already worked that in you. How did he work it out? Graciously. For his good pleasure. To please the Lord. The next word is that which gives me strength. Who worked it in? God worked it in. Impossible from our point of view, isn't it? But God, the mighty God, has worked this truth into your life, in your heart. Then you might wonder, how do we work it out? Look into verse 15. Therefore, my dearly brother, loved ones, I think it is verse 12. As you have always obeyed, 
not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salary. How do you work it out? The dirty word you don't want to hear, even though we are adults, obey. Isn't it? When you sing it is easy, trust and obey. Because we emphasize the word trust. Obey we skip through. Obedience is very, 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 very difficult. How do we work it out? Obey. Obey. Now what is the secret of good Christian life? Continuously obeying what God whispers in the ear. If you are a Christian, if you are a believer, if you are walking with the Lord, you will agree with me. He not only speaks during these sessions and the church service, he continuously speaks to your heart. And let me share a word with Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. You know, this is why I am surprised when people run with others to hear what God has to say about us. You know, we want to hear, you know, as the Lord a word for me. You know, if God has a word for me, as a sheep, He will speak to me. But if any speaks, obey. How to, how to work it out? How to work it out a shining light, luminous light? God has already worked again. Work it out by obeying still small voice. I'm going to confess something. I'm feeling it even day long now. Before I started the journey, I did something without, uh, you know, really getting uh, uh, my wife approved. I gave a little bit of money to somebody. Soon as I got into the trail, very disturbing. I talked to her on the phone, but I want to tell her this to this. Little things, little things. God speaks, isn't it? How do you work it out? Make a shining life out of uh, in, in a very dark world? God has already worked with him graciously. You know, Christian life is so simple. Don't have to complicate. Trust and obey. There is no other way. To be happy in Jesus is to trust and obey. You know, there are people who have wonderful spiritual words in their mouth. You get near them. You know, you are bombarded with those words. You sing only spiritually. But the question is, are you obeying the Lord? Every area of your life, you want to shine, isn't it? How do you shine? And they Now look into the quality of obedience. Not only in my presence, did you see that word? But also much more in my absence. I think that is honest obedience. I think we all need that particular word also. We like to obey to show people. 
But in absence of this, you know, we Christians, we believers, may I use a little more spiritual word, saints in the Lord. Why not? Corinthians can be called saints. But the problem is that we put up a very good friend. Outside? Outwardly? Okay. Where people don't see? We keep it pending. That's okay, isn't it? Inward disobedience, pastor will not see, church people won't see, the elders won't see, family also won't see. How do you work out your salvation? God has wonderfully worked it in. Obey. Obey the still small voice of God. May I pause here for a moment and ask you, as you sit here, is your obedience up to date? Oh, major things we have. Minor things? Public things we have. Oh, yeah, we have. Great. Secret things? Look carefully into that verse. Paul says, with fear and trembling obey. Why should you fear and tremble? I'll give you the reason, three reasons. Weakness of my flesh. I must fear it. Look into your mirror, you see the man whom you should fear most. Or woman. Not easy person, very weak. If you disagree, I will take you and show you the life of Saint Peter. So strong, so committed. I think none of us belong to his growth. He gave up his nets and he gave up his boat and he gave up his family to serve the Lord. Why obey with fear and trembling? Weakness of the flesh. Secondly, deception of Satan. He can deceive you into your, you know, the, the obedience in your life. He can say, oh, this is all right. He can put a holy garment on our disobedience. And look like a, a wonderful act, isn't it? The attraction of the world. So powerful. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And then you shine. Very dark world. We need to shine. Yes, we need to shine. As sons of God, how do we shine? What is needed? Blameless life, moral integrity, inner sincerity, happy and contented life, non-quarrelsome, not picking up quarrels, People who are easy to get along with. You know, I think that's a better word. You know, some of us are so spiritual, others cannot get along with. And I don't think that is spiritual. But it is difficult. But remember, God has already worked it in. 
How do we work it out? By obeying. What kind of obedience? Sincere obedience. Not only external, very sincere to the internal things people don't see. Paul says, you obeyed when I was there, but now I am absent, I want you to obey. God will give you the grace. Do it with fear and and let me close with the story of a shining man. I use it always in my sermons. And this is a first hand sermon because I heard it from him in the testimony meeting. So it's not a you know preacher's story that goes to goes to exaggeration that it is passed from one person to another. This is a story I heard preach from the man. I was uh, with um, some um, software professionals in San Francisco area. You know, they are believers. They have a special get-together. They are all working in software. You know, and uh, they have a spiritual get-together by the study. They invited me to share God's word when they were meeting. And when I was there, uh, before I shared the word of God, one lady sang a song in Hindi, a wonderful song, beautiful. Then her husband came to speak. His name is Sunil Sarma. When you hear that name, you know the background. He shared how he came to know the Lord. In the crooked and perverse generation of I don't know whether it is politically right, crooked and perverse generation of San Francisco. He said he works with a young man called Edward. He all they are they are in a team, you know, those who are involved in the software they you know sometimes they work as a team. So Sunil and uh, Edward they are a team. They, develop the software, they take the software to the company, they install it. So they travel together quite a bit. So Sunil said when we travel together to distant places, we come to places where we go, go, we can go evening, go out evening, to whatever fast time we want. None in the family will know they can live in any mode of life they want. Sunil said, I was watching Edward, he will never do anything. And one statement he made. He said, he will not do, Sunil, Edward will not do anything that will bring doubt to his wife. Is that a good thing? He will not do anything that will bring a doubt in the mind of his wife. So carefully. And then Sunil said, when we come back, we fill our travel bills. He said, I have watched uh, Edward fill up the travel bills. Meticulously. Yeah. And he said, not once. Always. So one day as they were working, Sunil asked Edward, Edward, we go to distant places, you know, we can go to wild parties. Why don't you do it? Why are you so, you know, upright in you know? Edward smiled and said, Sunil, I love you. Then Edward said, Sunil, today we have a Bible study, you want to come? Sunil went. That night in that Bible study, Sunil Sarma came to the Lord. Next time I met Sunil Sarma, he's a pastor. A bright light. Not much of words. That word doesn't have much work. Blameless. 
sincere, happy and contented, non-quarrels. I wish we could sing that song. Jesus did such time with the pure light. Can we take that? Jesus lit a shine with a clear, pure, pure light, like a little candle burning in the night. In this world of darkness, we must shine, you in your small form. I don't know. It's not a hymn, I mean, it's a hymn. It's not a hymn that we sing often. We categorize it as a children's song, isn't it? I think this is a, a right song for us. Jesus did a shine with a clear pure light Like a little candle burning in the night In this world of dark You my son You knew more corner I am Can we sing that again? You know when you come to that word must Emphasize that word and put it into, right into your heart and say, I must shine. Jesus did such shine with a clear, clear light, like a little candle burning in the night. In this world of darkness, we must shine. You in your small corner and I in my Amen.